Hi again everyone, I'm Chris Tisdell and I'm a mathematician at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia. And I'm really excited uh, to be bringing you this presentation on recent research in mathematics. In this particular presentation, I'm going to show you uh, a new application of Banach's fixed point theorem to fractional differential equations of arbitrary order. So essentially the, um, the idea involves defining a new metric and that new metric uh, greatly simplifies the application of Banach's fixed point theorem um, for existence and um, uniqueness of solutions. And it also gives a nice evaluation um, for the convergence of the iterations involved. Now the uh, new metric that I'm going to introduce involves the classical mittag leffler function. Okay, well, the main problem that we're going to explore is this following uh, general system. So, um, essentially, it's a very general initial value problem, and you can think of this um, dq as um, some sort of generalized uh, fractional derivative here. Now, q could be um, a whole number here, or it could be a fraction, uh, hence the term fractional derivative and uh, fractional differential equation. Now I know um, probably the superscript here is quite small, so make sure you're watching this um, in the high definition setting. Okay, well if um, Q's one, then this differential operator dQ is just the regular uh, differential operator from a first course in calculus. Now this T sub ceiling Q minus 1 of X, well um, that's just the Maclaurin polynomial of order or degree ceiling Q minus 1 of the function X. The A uh, sub I's are all constants. The F is some continuous possibly nonlinear function. And you'll see something possibly a little bit strange on first sighting. Here we've got potentially a fractional derivative, but the initial conditions in 1.2 involve just regular derivatives. Now this um, um, type of problem was put forward by a mathematician called Caputo, and the argument was that the initial conditions with just uh, regular derivatives gives a more precise and accurate um, modelling of the phenomena involved. So that's the kind of um, style of initial conditions we'll be uh, working with. Okay, well in this presentation I'm going to show you um, a new application of uh, Banach's fixed point theorem to this problem. Now um, I'm not the only person of course to, to work on this problem and, and these kinds of applications. So I just wanted to quickly outline um, a few papers that um, have uh, that I found very interesting and that are re related to um, this particular work. Um, an early contribution was from Detailman Ford and then other um, publications built on top of that including um, these publications by Lakshmikantham and Vasala and um, these monographs by um, Kilbus et al and, and Detail. Now, um, all these papers were uh, interested in obtaining existence, uh, uniqueness, and approximation of solutions to this general initial value problem. So, for example, um, when does a solution exist? When is it unique? When is there only one solution? And how can we approximate the solutions if we know that they exist? Now, to give a, a brief summary of the methods in, involved in these type of papers, um, there are uh, two techniques, mainly the sequential technique of successive approximations, also called the Picard iterations, and also classical fixed point approaches of Banach and uh, Schauder. Well, how does this particular presentation differ from um, the, the ones in the literature? Well, they've motivated this particular presentation, um, and in particular, the uh, I'm going to use Banach's fixed point theorem, but I'm going to apply it in new ways. 
Uh, for example, a new metric is defined in this presentation in the fractional differential equation environment that greatly simplifies the application and also gives a nice evaluation for the convergence of the iterations involved. And um, th these ideas come from a forthcoming paper of mine. Okay, now with all these um, uh, references here, I've, um, I'll show you a, a, the list of references at the end of this presentation. Okay, well, a guiding principle herein is to incorporate desirable elements of um, the, a special function called the mittag leffler function. And even though the um, mittag leffler function's quite old, I still think that it's got a lot of potential um, to be used to uncover more of the qualitative properties for solutions to fractional differential equations. Okay, well a few preliminaries to um, uh, get us started and to keep this presentation somewhat self-contained. We define the Riemann-Louisville fractional derivative and integral of order q of some function y respectively by the following. Okay, so if q is 1, this just becomes the regular derivative, and if uh, q is 1 down here, then this is just the regular um, Riemann integral. Now, sometimes to save a little bit of space, we use this um, uh, superscript c uh, together here, and we, we call that the Caputo derivative. So I could have actually um, written this left-hand side as c dq of x. Now, this just saves a little bit of space and, and keeps it a bit more compact now. So I might actually switch in, in this presentation between the two. Okay, well, this uh, presentation involves uh, analysis of solutions and their existence and uniqueness to um, the initial value problem 1.1, 1.2. So what do we mean when we say a solution? Well, a solution to, to this initial value problem on some interval i is a, f a function that has um, a fractional derivative of order q and whose graph lies in the domain of little f and this function satisfies the fractional differential equation and the initial conditions. Now instead of dealing with this system here directly, a common uh, method in the theory of differential equations is to work with an equivalent integral equation, just, just because they're, um, in many cases, much easier to deal with. So we're going to use the following result from um, Kilbus et al's book. If f is continuous, then the initial value problem, 1.1, 1.2, is equivalent to this integral equation. Um, working on this problem is equivalent to working on 1.1, 1.2. So we'll use that a bit later. Now I did mention um, that the metric involved in this presentation involves uh, a special function called the mittag leffler function. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a quick overview of what it is. Essentially, um, the mittag leffler function plays a similar role in fractional calculus as the regular exponential function does in classical calculus. So this is a sort of a formal definition. This converges for all um, complex numbers z. But we're going to be particularly interested in this form here. OK, so um, if q equals 1, then this becomes a special exponential function. Here. So it's e to the beta t. Okay, so beta here is a positive constant. Okay, well, um, another uh, important quality of this mittag leffler function is the following. This function is the unique solution to this simple um, linear initial value problem. And we'll, we'll, we'll use that um, in the proof of the main result. Okay, well, the last uh, preliminary result that uh, we'll need is the following uh, general Gronwall inequality. 
for, um, um, I, I guess it's like a fractional uh, analog of, of um, uh, the famous Gronwell inequality. Okay, well, let a, b, and c be non-negative constants. Let rho be a continuous non-negative function defined on this interval. If rho satisfies this integral inequality on the interval, then on that interval we have the following inequality for rho. Okay, now, it seems rather abstract, but we'll apply that a little bit later on. Okay. Well, this section contains the main results of this presentation. And in particular, we're concerned with an optimal application of Banach's uh, fixed point theorem. Okay, now, I'm just going to speak a little bit about um, what I mean by uh, a so-called complete metric space, and I'll introduce Banach's uh, theorem as well. But it's just a, um, a, a, a quick overview. Okay, so um, Banach's fixed point theorem is set in the environment of uh, complete metric spaces. So I wanted to talk about that for a little bit. So let big X be a, a set, and let D be some kind of function defined on X cross X um, that's kind of like a, a distance function. It measures, uh, it gives a way of measuring distance between elements in the, the set big X. Okay. Now we call the pair x comma d a complete metric space if the following um, uh, conditions are satisfied. Okay, so um, the distant function's non-negative and it's zero if and only if uh, x equals y. We have some sort of symmetry property in two. This is some sort of triangle inequality in three. And part four um, involves the following. Well, for every sequence of elements in our set, big X, such that the limit of this distance uh, is zero as M and N go to infinity, there exists uh, a, a, a X in big X such that the limit of this sequence um, uh, I, I guess such that, that, that uh, x sub m converges to to this x. Okay, so um, I guess um, a wordy way of talking about four is the following: every Cauchy sequence a x sub k in our set. converges to a point or an element in X. Okay? But like I said, these are just basic um, uh, properties and I, I'm just overviewing. It's not giving detailed um, um, information here. Okay, well that's um, what we mean by a complete metric space. If 4 didn't hold, then we would just have what's known as a metric space and these would be the, the properties of a metric. Okay, well, this is uh, Banach's famous fixed point theorem. Suppose we have a complete metric space and some function or some operator, big F, that maps set X back into itself. If F is contractive, in the sense that there is a positive uh, constant sigma, such that this inequality holds for all elements or all points in big X, then the following is true. F has a unique fixed point U, that is, F of U equals U for some unique U in our set big X. And furthermore, if we define the following sequence recursively through these two um, uh, definitions, then this sequence will converge to the fixed point. Okay, so starting with any element in big X, I can, uh, I can form a sequence just through this sort of recursive relationship and that will converge to the fixed point. So Banach's theorem is very powerful. It gives you um, 
uh, the existence of some fixed point and also uh, at least a theoretical way of um, computing that fixed point. Now, uh, it may be um, unrealistic to, to sort of come up with the fixed point U because um, this will get very complicated or can get complicated as M becomes large, but you know, you can still um, maybe compute some iterations and, and, um, and ob obtain approximations to the fixed point. Okay, well, a couple of comments. This um, uh, condition 3.1, called a contraction condition, it is sensitive to um, the metric D in the sense that suppose I've got a set X, uh, so let, let's say a, um, a complete metric space. Um, a mapping may be contractive with respect to one metric, but it may not be contractive with, uh, with respect to another metric. So the choice of metric um, in your complete metric space, um, at least in the... In, context of this theorem is important. Okay, some are more useful than others. So what I've tried to do is to motivate it, uh, uh, I've been motivated to optimize the dependency between you know, the choice of metric and um, this contraction condition. I'm going to in, um, define a new metric that involves this special function, the mittag leffler function. Okay, so the significance in this choice is that this particular metric will be optimal in the sense that it forces the operator, the F involved, to be contractive on the whole of this set. Okay, by this I just mean the space of continuous functions on this interval, rather than just being contractive on a smaller set. So in this way, as we'll see, Banach's uh, theorem will apply directly to the problem under consideration, and there's no need to firstly obtain the existence of some fixed point on a set of this type where h is less than a and then to extend the, the theorem across to the whole interval as in Kilbus et al's book nor is there any um, uh, need to appeal to more abstract versions of Banach's uh, classical theorem as in uh, for example D. Helms and Ford's paper okay well um, I mentioned that you may be able to um, use this recursively defined sequence to approximate uh, fixed points. We know they exist, so let's go out and try to you know, find them or approximate them. Well, Banach's theorem provides the following estimate on the error between the nth iteration, f, uh, fmy, and the fixed point u, namely here. Okay. So this is, this is um, useful from a practical purpose. So you can see it depends on the sort of the distance between the starting value y and f of y. And then um, you know, as m increases, this is going to get smaller because sigmas are uh, between 0 and 1, strictly between 0 and 1. OK? OK, well, let's define the trick. Let beta be a positive constant and let q be positive. Consider the space of continuous function. So this is like going to be our set x. And let's form the following uh, metric. Okay, so you can see essentially um, it's just the maximum of this um, part here. So I'm dividing by this um, mittag leffler function. Now, if beta equals um, zero, for example, then we get this maximum metric, and this is this is well known. Okay, so if we couple this with this, we get a complete metric space. So I'm just going to slightly generalize that metric by defining this to be our metric. Okay, d sub beta. I'm going to refer to that as. Okay, well, um, the d sub beta is a new generalization of uh, a metric originally due to Belecki. Okay, so and here are some um, um, some references where you can um, look up Belecki's metric. It, essentially, it's just um, uh, Belecki covered the case for q equals one. Okay, so for q equals one, that bottom part will become e, little e, to the beta t. 
Okay, so some important properties of this new metric are now listed. Um, well, d sub beta really is a metric. d sub beta is uh, equivalent to the max metric, d sub naught. And this pair forms a complete metric space. Well, I'm not going to um, prove everything there, but let me just give you an overview. If beta is positive and, and a constant, then we have um, the mittag left flow function being positive on this interval. Also, the mittag left flow function is continuous on the interval. And the three properties of a metric um, either listed earlier, one, two, three, or in um, Copson's book on metric spaces can be easily verified. d sub beta is equivalent to the max metric. Well, by that I mean there are some constants such that the following inequality holds. Okay, so um, uh, essentially I've just formed some inequalities and come up with this, and this is what we mean by um, you know, two metrics being equivalent. Okay, so for part three, the completeness of this pair, so in other words, um, the um, I mean this really is a, a a complete metric space follows from the completeness of this metric space here and part two. So if we have a Cauchy sequence in this metric space then two ensures that that sequence is a Cauchy sequence in our new metric space and furthermore um, it can be shown that there is a continuous function x such that this limit is zero. Now as a result of the, um, the equivalence between the two metrics we then have this happening. Okay, so hence our, our Cauchy sequence really is convergent and the limit is a continuous function. In other words, the x is uh, in our, metric, our complete metric space. Okay, so this is a complete metric space. Okay, so um, in what follows, we're going to now apply these ideas to the initial value problem. 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 we've, we've got all the machinery to do it now. Let's think of S being some sort of infinite strip here. Okay, so this is like going to be the domain of our, of our little F in the right hand side of 1.1. Alright, well let's have a look at the main result. So let's consider our initial value problem 1.1, 1 1.2. 1 let the right hand side, little f, be continuous on this strip. If there exists a positive constant, big L, such that f satisfies this inequality on the strip, then the initial value problem, 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 has a unique solution on this interval. Okay, so I guess that's the first conclusion. Now, 3.5 is known, a very um, famous condition known as a Lipschitz condition on F. Okay, and this is quite common in the um, um, analysis of, of differential equations. Well, there's a second part to our theorem. In addition, if a sequence of functions, x sub i, is defined in, uh, inductively by choosing any continuous function to be your x sub naught and setting x sub um, i plus 1 equal to this, so you've sort of defined it in a recursive manner, then the, se the, the sequence x sub i converges uniformly on this interval to the unique solution. So again, this can give you some way of approximating um, the solution to the original problem, 1.1, 1.2. Okay, well, essentially for the proof, we are just going to apply Banach's fixed point theorem. So essentially you want to show that um, these conditions hold. Okay. All right, well, a little bit of housekeeping first. Let's just look at this sequence here. Well, since x0 is continuous and f is continuous on the strip, this is uh, well defined for, for each i. Okay, well, let L be the positive constant in 3.5. This is, L here is known as a Lipschitz constant. And we're going to set beta in this proof to be L times some number gamma, where gamma is just an arbitrary constant that's just greater than 1.
okay? So we're going to form our complete metric space here using the, the uh, D sub beta metric with this beta here. And let's define our operator big F by this. Now, this is generated from um, lemma 2.1. Let me just see if I can find it. Ah. Okay, so we know that the initial value problem has a solution if and only if this problem has a solution. Now, if I just take the right hand side and set that, define that to be my big F, then essentially the problem is now showing that F has a unique fixed point. Okay, so that's how, that, that's where, or how I guess I've defined the big F in 3.7. Okay, well, essentially, um, by the just what I just said, um, limit 2.1, showing the existence of fixed points of this F is equivalent to showing the existence of solutions to the initial value problem 1.1, 1.2. So it will, essentially what we want to do is prove that there exists a unique X such that F of X equals X. Now to do this we need to of course satisfy the conditions of Banach's fixed point theorem. Okay, so there are a few conditions to satisfy. We want to show, we want, first of all, we want to be working in a complete metric space, which we are. We want to show that F maps the set big X back into itself. And we want to show that F is contractive. Okay, so, so you can think of big X being the space of continuous functions, continuous real valued functions on this interval, 0 to A. And First of all, let's show that for every continuous function, x, f of x is also continuous on this interval. Well, since little f is continuous on the strip, this will also be continuous on this interval. And um, for verification, you can, you can just see Kilbass's uh, et al.'s um, book. That's not the main focus of this proof. The interesting thing is showing that actually f is a contraction, big F is a contraction with respect to the d sub beta metric. Okay, well to show that we need the following fundamental, kind of like a, a fundamental um, identity from fractional calculus. Um, IQ of the Caputo derivative of say some function z is just z minus this um, uh, sum here. Okay, so we'll use that in the, in the proof of the contraction. Okay, so we now show that big F is contractive with respect to this metric. So let little x and little y be uh, any continuous functions on this interval and consider um, uh, this d sub beta of f of x comma f of y. Okay, well it's just this. And if I write out each of these, I get this, right? Oh, actually, I can put another line here and then I can move the absolute values inside the um, integral signs and come up with this. Now we've assumed that little f is Lipschitz. So I can then move from this to this. There is, a, there is an L such that this is less than or equal to this. So I can, I, I can move from here to here. So what I've done now is in the integrand, I've inserted these mittag leffler functions. Okay, so what I can do now is this this part is going to be less than or equal to the maximum of this. So actually I can take this, uh, max it up, and move it out the front. That's actually, this part, if I max it up, is um, um, just this d sub beta of x and y. Okay, so that comes out, and I'm left with this. Now, this is just iq of the Caputo derivative of this um, mittag leffler function. Okay, so by the fundamental theorem here, I can come up with the following. Now, for um, the mittag leffler function, all of these coefficients are zero, except for the first one. 
okay, which is one. So that's why I only get you know one term here. Okay, well I've I've got that now, and what I can do is divide this in here, and and the beta is going to um, cancel off with the L because we've defined um, we've defined beta to be L times gamma, so I can I, I can get a bit of cancellation there. So I'm left with this. Well, the max of this just occurs when um, t equals a at the right-hand endpoint. So I can come up with this, and then you know essentially this is just less than or equal to the following. Now at the start, we um, the gamma is any constant that is greater than one. So if we look, move from here to here, big, we see that big F is a contractive map with contraction constant sigma equals one on gamma, and this has got to be strictly less than one because gamma is greater than one. So we've satisfied all the conditions then of Banach's theorem, and so big F must have a unique fixed point. And that means that our initial value problem, 1.1, 1.2, must have a unique, a unique solution. Okay, and uh, just sort of applying the second part of, of Banach's theorem, the sequence x sub i defined in 3.6 must converge uniformly in the metric uh, d sub beta. And um, uh, the sequence also converges uh, uniformly in the max metric d sub naught to the, the fixed point um, x. So this completes the proof. So you can see essentially it's just sort of um, adding in these special functions here and then using basic properties to get the um, contraction um, condition satisfied. Okay, well a few um, comments. The statement of theorem 3.5 is not new, but the application of this d sub beta metric is new and it does optimize the proof. Uh, for example, if we were given, uh, if we were using the maximum metric d sub naught, as in Kilbas et al. et al.'s book, then Banach's theorem would only be contractive on this smaller set where h is strictly less than a. So uh, you you'd get unique existence and uniqueness, but on a smaller interval. And what you would need to do then is systematically extend that um, solution to the whole of this interval. So the proof of, of, that I've just shown you illustrates that the approach of Kilbas et al's of existence and then extension is, is really unnecessary. Uh, in addition, um, the proof demonstrates that invoking more abstract versions of Banach's theorem is, is really unnecessary. The, the basic um, theorem of Stefan Banach will suffice. Now theorem 3.5 um, addresses one of Dethelm's remarks in his recent monograph, which encouraged more research on the problem um, and an easing of restrictions on the F involved. All right, well, um, in view of the remark 3.3 on the um, uh, convergence of the rate of convergence of iterates, we can use this special function and, and the d sub beta metric to evaluate the rate of convergence of iterates. So if x and x sub naught are continuous functions, beta is defined in this way with gamma strictly uh, greater than 1, then 3.2 yields the following. And so um, um, we can come up with the following. Here the, uh, um, the sort of parallel lines with the naught is the I guess the uh, a norm, a so-called norm. So, um, you know, um, basically, you can think of a norm as kind of like a, a metric, in the sense that you're measuring distance between um, x a, a, to to zero. Okay. Okay, so I mean these look rather abstract, but I think they give a nice evaluation on the rate of convergence. Okay, well, um, there is another result that I, I quickly want to um, present. The so-called um, relationship between the solutions of our initial value problem, 1.1, 1.2, and um, how they depend on the initial conditions in uh, 1.2. Okay, so the following theorem says the following. 
The solution supplied under the conditions of the previous theorem is so-called Lipschitz continuous in the initial conditions A. Now, I've written A as a vector there in boldface. Uh, here I mean sort of A sub naught, A sub 1, A sub 2, etc. Uniformly in T. In addition, for any two sets of initial conditions, A sub I and B sub I, I equals 1 to C of in Q minus 1, we have the following. Okay, so what does this tell you? Well, it tells you that if a naught's close to b naught, a one's close to b one, etc., etc., then this sort of gives you an estimate for um, the the difference between two solutions. Uh, it should be small. Okay, so to prove this, um, essentially you write both of uh, both of the problems as an integral equation, and you take one away from the other, and then you use a Lipschitz condition, and you come up with something like this. Now. For this, um, from this setting, you can apply the general Gronwall's inequality, lemma 2.2, with the following, and come up with this um, inequality here. Now, when I say um, uh, Lipschitz continuity, just you know, form another inequality here, replace t with a, and then um, you know that sort of form is what I mean by Lipschitz continuity um, of x in the initial conditions. All right, well, let's have a look at an example and see if we can um, form some, some concreteness here. Consider this f here, t plus p plus tan inverse p. And the claim is that this f satisfies the conditions of our main theorem, theorem 3.5. And hence, for all positive q, the associated initial value problem has a unique solution. So essentially, all we want to do there is show that this f satisfies the conditions of theorem 3.5, which is just con continuity on the, the strip involved and a Lipschitz condition. So let's, let's do it. Well, this is continuous for all t and all p, so it must be continuous on every strip. The second thing we are going to show is that f satisfies this uh, Lipschitz condition. Okay, so to do that, um, it's well known that actually um, a sufficient condition is to show that dfdp is uniformly bounded on the strip. So let's just differentiate this partially with respect to p. We'll get this and show that this is bounded. We can use this bound as uh, a, Lipschitz con a Lipschitz constant L. So uh, this is bounded by 2, so L would be 2 here. So the conditions of theorem 3.5 are satisfied and we would um, conclude that the initial value problem associated with this f has a unique solution for every q uh, positive. Now I'm going to leave you with some further reading. If you want more um, uh, detail, you can see it in my forthcoming paper and I'll put a link to the journal when um, this paper becomes available. And I've also listed some references that I've been referring to throughout the presentation. Now, I haven't um, probably referred to everything in this list, but if I haven't, then just consider it as additional reading. So let me show you some of those quickly. So thanks for watching everyone, I hope you found this presentation useful and I'll be bringing you more research presentations in the future.